contemplating the evil, deliver us from evil, uh, which, is, which is kind of an abstract idea, um, although we're going to talk about it a little bit more from the perspective of the Gospel of Matthew, how Matthew frames for us this concept of evil. Um, but going back, way back, to some pretty old Christian traditions, there's been the um, desire that this verse be translated, deliver us from the evil one. And grammatically, uh, either one is a correct choice. Uh, mainly because the word evil has the definite article in front of it. So it can mean deliver us from evil, because sometimes uh, in uh, the text you can have, how can I say this? It's almost abstract ideas do have a definite article, which, which, which is weird for us in English, because we think, well, if it's abstract, it can't have something definite with it. It's, al it's almost like it's a contradiction. Uh, but at the same time, since it does have the definite article, it can be translated as the evil one. And uh, I think I, I did a cut and paste here from the ESV uh, online. I don't know if the printed version is the same. But the ESV uh, online uh, had the footnote D to let you know that there is an option of translating that as the evil one. Um, this is an important part of the prayer because it makes, it makes us sit up and take notice and be aware of the presence of temptation and evil that is in our world. And let's talk about both of those. I was thinking about this tonight uh, before I had dinner. Um, you can almost make two circles that, that overlap. And on the one circle, we can call that temptation. The other, we can call it trials. So when you have temptation and trials, the, the, one, the thing that sort of separates the two is traditionally, you think of temptation, and this is according to James 1, temptation is what your heart um, is tempted toward, and it's kind of like that's inward stuff. Whereas testing and trials are more of external pressure brought on you and how you react to it. Now, obviously, as I said, if you overlap those circles, there's going to be some ideas that you're going to share both with testing and temptation. And that would be an interesting lesson in and of itself to think about all of those overlapping ideas that both uh, tempting uh, and testing uh, share together. But in this prayer, this is a specific um, awareness that we need to have in our prayer life that... Uh, temptation and evil are in our world. Uh, that, that, um, well, I'll, I'll say more about that in a minute. Uh, it indicates an ongoing spiritual struggle. And it makes us realize that Satan is indeed real. I don't know all the ways in which Satan works. Uh, but it is clear from Scripture that Satan in all of his schemes and wiles and tricks and, and everything he's got in his bag, uh, he's trying to get us to give in to temptation and participate in evil. That's his goal. And as I think about this part of the prayer, we know that both temptation and evil are against God's nature. Uh, all that God stands for. It's against his kingdom. It's against his will being done. And it tries to eclipse the fact that everything good we have comes from God. Everything we need comes from God because it is the opposite of the mind of Christ and the kind of mind that we need to have to pray this prayer. Okay, well, let's, let's start with looking at this uh, part of the prayer together. Uh, it's an emphatic plea that has both a negative and a positive aspect to it. For example, do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Um, this kind of reminds us, I've, I've jumped over to Mark chapter 1, and you may remember this episode. Uh, this is after Jesus' baptism in Mark chapter 1. 
Uh, the voice comes from heaven. It says, you are my son whom I, whom I love with you. Uh, uh, I am well pleased. At once the spirit sent him out into the desert. Well, that's not strong enough. Um, I think some translations say the spirit led him out. It, it really, uh, the language is strong and it's forceful. And of course, a lot of commentators have, have wondered why. But it's a compound word which means kicked out. <laughs> the Holy Spirit kicked him out into the desert. It's a strong compound verb. Uh, and again, like I said, there's been all sorts of um, speculation on why that word was needed to describe Jesus um, going out into the desert for the temptation. Drove him out. See, that's getting closer to what I'm talking about. Um, yeah, which one is that one, Bill? Is that the the new? Okay, or the New American Standard, the NAS, the New English. I'm not New English. Do I know about the New English Standard? I don't guess I. I don't guess I've referenced that one much. The new is it? Is it the NES? Is that what it's called? It's an online thing. The New English Standard. I've got to check that out. What's it close to? Is it close to the New American Standard? Kind of? Uh, it's probably closer to the New, uh, New King James. Oh, is it? Okay, okay. Huh. But it sounds like it's within what we call the Tyndale tradition. Okay. I'll, I'll check that out, though. But, but see, that, that is getting closer to what Mark said. The Spirit drove him out, kicked him out there. Okay? Now, the reason I'm saying that is because think about this language. Lord, do not lead us into temptation. It almost sounds as if in the prayer, there, there's something within the human heart that recognizes God can do some things that obviously we don't have control over. And what we're really hoping is that against our will, the Lord doesn't lead us into an area we're not ready for. Okay? But do not lead us into temptation. But do lead us. This is kind of the positive side. And this is, this is what the whole rest of this part of the prayer is about. Is recognizing what God can do for us. Don't do this, but here's what we really would prefer that you do. And it is a belief in, this is what's interesting to me. It's a belief in God's direct involvement in our Christian life. How direct? I don't have the answer. How do you always know? I'm not sure. <laughs> but it, to me, and, and, and this could be up for wonderful discussion, to me it makes a difference. And it seems like you can, you can count it among many of the Christian blessings that we enjoy. Just the awareness that God has direct involvement in our life related to our prayer life. And we all kind of know that anyway, don't we? Sometimes we see it in the ways in which we will pray a prayer, and lo and behold, the Lord answers it exactly the way we prayed it, and we're like, wow. But then also you have to remember that direct involvement could be just as strong a no as it could be a yes. So we, we have to be open to that. But it seems to me this is one of the many blessings that we enjoy in our Christian worldview. Uh, and that is that we live in a world in which we believe in God's direct involvement in our life related to our prayer life. Now, the writer goes on to say, lead us not into temptation. This is the communal dimension of accountability. Um, and we don't have time tonight to do this. I, if I had time, I was wanting to do this, to, to walk ourselves through Matthew, look at the community dimension of the faith. Now, we in America, uh, and many of us, have, have a background that we prize uh, our individual rights and our individualism. And I don't want to downplay that. Uh, but at the same time, we have to understand we're part of a believing community. That's our identity. Much more so than our country identity. Uh, 
you can ask it this way, and of course the class tonight is not designed to answer this question, but, but where do you put the emphasis? Am I an American who happens to be a Christian, or am I a Christian who happens to be an American? Think about how you would answer that and what that means for you before God. Uh, so with the community dimension in Matthew, the church encompasses those in community and in covenant faith with God. And that's crucial. Um, I think probably the best way that we experience it in our congregation here is those of you who have been committed to small groups over a period of time, think about your sense of identity wrapped up in that small group. How important that is for you. The things that you do together as small group. Um, and and you, you can begin to get an insight into what church is supposed to be like with community. Um, lead us not into temptation. There's an old morning prayer that's connected, I think, with Psalm 15.3. And it says, Lord, open our lips that we may declare your praise. And supposedly, um, in early Christian communities, they would start in the morning as the sun came up. They would say that together. And notice again, it's in the plural. Open our lips that we may declare your praise. Uh, and so through the centuries, since the beginning of the church, there's been the recognition that our fundamental identity is in the community of Christ. Okay, let's jump over to Matthew chapter 4, and I want to look at Jesus' own temptation story. Because I think this sets the stage for the power of this part of the, what we call the Lord's Prayer. Uh, in Matthew 4, let's begin with verse 1. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. And Matthew uses the much more softer word for leading someone. He doesn't use the real strong word that Mark does. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you're the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, it is written, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city, had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you're the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. And Jesus answered, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And again, the devil took him to a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I'll give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And then the devil left him and angels came and attended him. Man, there's so much in this, isn't there? Um, let's look at a moment at this temptation from a couple of perspectives. Notice that Jesus is led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. So what's the devil's work? It's simple, temptation. That's why he's called the tempter. He's good at this. What's interesting is that he tries, he tries three different approaches to get Jesus to bow down and worship him, doesn't he? Uh, how would you characterize the first approach? He says, if you're the son of God, command that these stones may made, be made bread. What's Satan, what's he, what do you think he's trying to do there? Well, so if that's true, if Jesus had made the stones into bread, would that have been a sin? No. 
it makes us pause a minute before we say no, doesn't it? Um, let me throw you out what, what I think might be going on here. And then, of course, you can, you can throw in what you think might be going on. It's almost as if, um, have, you, have you heard the expression, uh, gateway drugs? Okay. I almost feel like Satan wanted this first temptation to serve as a gateway temptation. And, and think about it. Not necessarily that he's doing anything wrong or evil. And, and, and a little bit later in tonight's lesson, we've got to come to gra grips with and grapple with this concept of evil. And yet, it may be that Satan's thinking, if I can get Jesus to say yes to this, because Bill, he is, I think he is exactly doing that. He is appealing to the very natural uh, hunger that Jesus would have after, and the need for something to eat after going through the days of temptation. If it wouldn't be a sin for him to make the, the, the stones and the bread, but it would be a sin for him to eat because he had already made a commitment to fast. If that's before his commitment comes up, <laughs> yeah, yeah. If he broke that covenant, that would be true. Uh, and it may be that Satan is feeling like if he can get Jesus to say yes to this, then the other ones are going to be easier to follow along. So it may be that because because a lot of people when you read through a lot of things that people have written through the years about this first temptation, it's almost a head scratcher, except, and think about this, you probably have heard this too. Notice how he conditions the temptation. If you are the son of God, okay, making Jesus prove who he was, either before his time or by methods that Jesus had really planned on using, at least as far as Satan's concerned. Well, <laughs> yeah, that might, that might be part of the picture too. It's so interesting to think about this. Um, so this first temptation, notice what Jesus does. Uh, you talk about really having um, a wonderful uh, heart for the Father and being aware of Scripture. He says it's written... Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. You see, Jesus understood what life was all about. And it's not just about getting something in your stomach any way possible. Uh, there's some people that would say another reason that he resisted this first one is because if he had performed it, um, it would be the only time that we have Jesus performing a miracle for his own self-interest. I don't know that that would make it wrong in and of itself, but it would have been the only time that we have that recorded. Oh yeah. And that's how, that's how the Jews understood it. That it was not only a preparation for festivals and other things, but it was understood is how you prepared your heart to be in covenant relationship with God. And depending on what time of the year you uh, were involved in it, different activities were attached to it. Here's what's interesting. On all three of these temptations, Jesus quotes scripture. Are you aware that all three quotations come from the same book of the Old Testament? What book is that? Anybody remember? This, this, is a, this is a test on your, your memory tonight. This is a pop quiz. Anybody remember where all three of his, his quotations come from? They come from Deuteronomy. All three of them. And people who follow the ministry of Jesus and look at the way Jesus operated in the Gospels will say something like this. One of the reasons that Jesus quoted these three from Deuteronomy, and I suspect he, he could have quoted, uh, you know, same kind of ideas from other texts in the Old Testament. But it's because Jesus is in the wilderness, he recognizes the power of God to get him through the wilderness. 
as Israel needed to know who God was and rely on God's will and direction through their wilderness wanderings. And so there's a huge connection between Jesus in the wilderness, Israel in the wilderness, and a lot of neat uh, sub-themes that you can look at whenever you delve into that. So Jesus' own temptation story sets the stage here. Now what Satan does in chapter uh, 4, verse 6, um, he, he's going to try Jesus' tack. Because he says, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written. Think about this. Did you know that scripture can be used for satanic purposes? Now, now when I say that, you can automatically bring to your mind things you know of through the years that that describes. Script, and and uh, every time I read something like this, I am reminded of... Peter's observation in 2 Peter chapter 3. He says, there are some people who twist the scriptures to their own destruction. So when, when you misuse and abuse scripture for your own purposes, uh, it results in spiritual destruction. And of course, like I said, in our own lifetime, we've actually seen that happen. And here, uh, and the reason I hate this is because uh, Psalm 91 is one of the most beautiful psalms in all the Old Testament. Uh, you may remember after 9-11, whenever they had the uh, special service at the National Cathedral, there was a choral group that sang that arrangement from Psalm 91. You may remember that. And this, this psalm has one of the most beautiful uh, choral arrangements from the psalms. It's one of my favorite. I'm like, how in the world could Satan grab my psalm? <laughs> Well, Satan's always trying to do that, trying to twist Scripture and use it against its intended use. Um, it's interesting in verse 10, and we'll use this to kind of close off of Jesus' uh, temptation. Away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Jesus recognized that God demanded um, solitary worship. There was to be um, no competition, no other idols. There was not to be uh, Satan to be worshipped or followed. And the devil left him and the angels came and attended to him. And I'm thinking, well, Matthew, how come you didn't tell us more about that? Uh, I wish I'd have known what the angels did when they attended to him. Uh, but no doubt came and maybe fed him, uh, supported him, encouraged him. Um, but this, this whole temptation narrative of Jesus' ministry helps us appreciate that in this prayer that he offers as a model for uh, the disciples that he knows what it's like to go through temptation. Now I want to look at uh, yes Satan does not come to Jesus right after he gets out there and he waits 40 days and 40 nights until he's at his weakest physical point yeah. And, and some would say at his weakest physical point, but perhaps his strongest spiritual point. Because he's had, uh, and, and that's another thing. Don't you wish that we had a daily diary for those 40 days? <laughs> what did Jesus do for those 40 days? He may have spent all that time immersed in prayer. You know, meditation. I mean, he obviously was doing something, I think, to get himself ready for this. Okay. Um, so this leads us then, I want to talk a moment about temptation in Matthew. Uh, in Matthew 18, 7, Woe to the world for temptations to sin, for it is necessary that temptations come, but woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. Uh, there is this woe pronounced on individuals by Jesus, that if you allow yourself to be used by Satan to tempt people, and to destroy them, you're going to be held accountable for that role. Um, one of the worst things that we can, um, and, and think about this, we often think the worst thing in the world is for Satan to beat up on me, or however, however you want to phrase that. But think about, Jesus is saying here, I need to be aware that if I'm not careful, Satan can work through me to destroy others. And I really need to be aware of that and be asking that God keep me safe from that kind of thing 
and that instead of Satan using me for others, God can use me for others. It's, it's up to whoever I want uh, to be a servant of. Now, the other one is in Matthew 26, verse 41. Uh, this passage you're very familiar with. Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak, as he tells his disciples as he's there in the garden. So we find that uh, there are, it's necessary to watch and pray so you don't enter into temptation. I get the impression about the nature of temptation falling to it, that we are most vulnerable when we haven't watched and prayed about that. Uh, have, you ever had, have you ever told someone or you've heard someone say, boy, I didn't see that coming. That hit me from, you know, you know uh, um, I got blindsided from it. Hit me from left field. I didn't see it coming. Well, and it may be because if you don't watch and pray, uh, that's where you're most vulnerable. And that's where you can fall to temptation. And Jesus knew this about his disciples. And so he made them aware of the need to watch and pray. Now, one of the things, too, that's a fascinating study in the rest of the New Testament is, is the idea of uh, what it means. Let's see, I didn't put that on here. We'll talk about evil in a second. But there's, a, there's, there's some passages in the rest of the New Testament about temptation I think are crucial. Galatians 6, 1, we know this one. Brothers, if anyone's caught in a transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. And there, there's two ways of taking that, that you too could be tempted by the very thing that other person was, that you could fall to it just like they did, or because you both share the same humanity, uh, it may be that that person that you're trying to talk to, be gentle with, restore them, encourage them, um, they may need to be the very ones to turn around and do the same thing for you because you're going to do something in the future uh, that's wrong, that you fall into temptation. trying to make decisions about other people's lives. Oh, you don't want to <laughs> you don't want to get caught up in that. Yeah. Of reaching out to people and trying to help them uh, is to become overbearing. Oh, yeah. Ooh. We have a lot yeah. of that in the church, which people <laughs> want to throw others out. Oh, surely not. No. Um, uh, yeah, again, that's another whole lesson in itself. But uh, just, just to be aware that you have to be careful when you restore a person uh, in the spirit of gentleness. And sometimes I think in the past, attempts were made at that, but the whole spirit of gentleness was missing. It's kind of like what you're talking about. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 3, 5. For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, Paul says, I sent to learn about your faith for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you and our labor would have been in vain. Uh, I like Paul's ambiguity here. Somehow the tempter had tempted you. Uh, he's not, he doesn't have any specific things he can point out, but he has this gnawing kind of inner uh, angst uh, about what Satan might be up to uh, in the lives of his converts and with, uh, uh, with the church at Thessalonica uh, that he has spent so much time with, planted that church, and now he's just, he, he, it kind of reminds me of a comment he makes in Galatians. You may remember what Paul said, that I'm like a woman in labor pain until Christ is formed in you. Now, let, let's think about this for a moment, because I, I see Paul as an apostle who had many, many sleepless nights for a lot of reasons. But one of them is just the inner anguish for those uh, Christians that he knew and whether they were men or women, but, but ones that he knew. And he knew that they had not grown much spiritually. And he knew how vulnerable they were to the work of Satan. And he, he agonized over that. And I would suspect that each one of us sitting here tonight, we've had our own experience, perhaps, 
of agonizing over people we know that are not where they need to be spiritually. We know that. Now, they may not know that, but we know that. We can see it, and we know where things are headed. Uh, and we may have even tried to say something, but they're not getting the hint. Uh, and so you just agonize over that. And I see a lot of Paul's um, inner spiritual life agonizing over people like that because for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you. He's aware of that activity going on over here by Satan. In 1 Timothy 6 verse 9, But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. And it would be interesting if at this point Paul you know, had given Timothy some specific uh, examples. And it may be just by referring to that, uh, he knew that Timothy would pick up on it. That he knows of situations where those who had a lot, you know, they, were, they were well off, but they, felt, they let that temptation um, make them fall into a snare. And it just, it just totally ruined them. So possessions, money, physical things like that that you tend to make your idol and you put your security in uh, can really be used by Satan to plunge people into ruin and destruction. Um, Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 2 verse 18, For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he's able to help those who are being tempted. That's a great statement for Jesus in his ministry as our high priest. In Hebrews 4.15, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. In every respect. It doesn't matter what we go through. Jesus in every respect can identify with our world of temptations. Now you talk about that being a part of the good news, that just blows my mind. So that I can never in the back of mind say, well, Jesus never had to deal with that. He doesn't understand. That's not what the writer says. Uh, we, need to under, we need to know that Jesus does understand in every respect. That would be a great support for us. Okay, now in this prayer also, it raises the question of what evil is. Evil is that which is bad. Uh, in Matthew 5, 11, we have this reference. It, it's uh, all kinds of evil. Uh, turn to Matthew 5, verse 11. See, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Now, let's take this word for evil. And I, let me look here. I was shocked. I guess I knew this. If you all knew this, um, I'm looking, 20, at least 27 times the word evil crops up in Matthew. And as I began looking at that, it, it, it's a concept which kind of goes across the board in so many different directions. Now think about this one in Matthew chapter 5 uh, and verse 11. It has to do with what people can say falsely against you because of your faith. Um, think how people could say things that would malign your motives. Or they judge your motives. Or they say things intensely or, or intentionally false to misrepresent your faith. To try and heap trouble on you. See, think, think of what speaking evil like that would mean and what form it would take with people around you who are intentionally trying to either destroy you or destroy your influence. And when we say it generally like that, well, then it comes a little bit closer to home because, I mean, we don't, we don't receive the kind of persecution that some of the early Christians did. But in many situations, uh, if you are a, a confessing Christian and you live that, uh, you may be in situations where people are going to say things that Matthew would say in an instant and in a heartbeat, that's evil. Okay? Now, look at Matthew 5.37. This is interesting. Uh, this is where he brings up the whole thing about 
don't break your oath. You've heard people say that from long ago. But keep the oaths you've made to the Lord. But I tell you, don't swear at all, either by heaven, for it's God's throne, or by the earth, for it's God's footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it's the city of God. Don't swear by your head. Um, simply let your yes be yes and your no, no. Because anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Or uh, a lot of translations will say, and I think the King James used to say this, anything beyond this is of evil. But notice, and, and the NIV does this, anything beyond this comes from the evil one. And you're thinking, well, wait a minute, well, let's back the truck up here a minute. You mean someone's saying, well, I swear by the God of heaven, I'll do that. Or, I, or, or I'll swear by the steps of the temple in Jerusalem, I'll do that. Well, what's Jesus after here? How can that be evil? It's not saying anything wrong. It's not like I'm cussing anybody out. <laughs> you know, how can that be evil? Oh, well, it makes you step back and look at what is Jesus after? He is after the kind of life that's lived with simple integrity that when you say yes, people know that your yes means yes. That's it. And you're living the kind of life that when you say no, people understand that your no means no. And that's it. Because he's dealing with in his day and time in the culture there with the Jews, they'd gotten to the point you couldn't have that simple conversation. And it's almost as if it got into a competition to see who could string out the greatest number of oaths before you could finally believe somebody. I mean, that would drive, think about that, that would drive me nuts. <laughs> Trying to figure out eventually, okay, did he give me enough and the right kind of oaths that I can finally believe in him? And Jesus is like, oh, man. And it's interesting that he uses this word evil to describe that. So evil is that which is the opposite of a simple life filled with integrity that means what it says and lets the words just rest there. Wow. That, that's amazing to me. Okay. And we're running out of time. Let me jump forward. So in this prayer then... Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And in Matthew, the evil one does all kinds of things. And we don't have time to go through all of them. But even in temptation in the rest of the New Testament, um, I found that there are at least uh, six significant concepts and texts. Where in Galatians 6, 1, we've already talked about that. We have to be careful both ways. I could be helping you through your temptation but boy, I need to be, have that spirit of gentleness because you may need to come around and help me. Uh, there is the fear of the tempter. Um, what We need to be aware of what Satan can do. We've already talked about riches tempting us. Jesus helps us. Jesus himself was tempted in every way as we're tempted. And James says when we're tempted, we can't have any excuses. We can't say, God made me do it. The devil made me do it. And no, 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 no. It starts inside here. You know, own up to it. And there's a strong contrast of recognition of what God can do. Um, lead us not into temptation, but God, what can you do? We believe that you can deliver us. Notice how Jesus was delivered and ministered to at the end of his uh, temptation narrative. And there's a quote in the temptation from the Psalms uh, about deliverance. Uh, in fact, many of them in the Psalms and in the Old Testament. Deliverance, this is interesting. Deliverance is one of those key concepts of Israel's ongoing identity as God's people. And we know that from the Exodus, don't we? God's people were delivered. Well, guess what? You and I were delivered from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. We as God's people also have been delivered. And that is such a uh, a basis or such an important part of the basis of our identity. Uh, and I think we got just enough time to say this before we quit. Look at 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 13. And we don't have time to go through the whole thing, but I do want to mention this. 1 Corinthians 10, uh, Paul is going to use an illustration from Israel's history. And Notice in verse 6, he says, Now these things occurred as examples or types 
to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. Uh, we should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. We should not test the Lord as some of them did. Do not grumble as some of them did. Verse 11, these things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. And then he says, so if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. So, you know, don't be so egocentric and so conceited and full of self that you don't think, ah, I don't need God's help. That's never going to be a problem for me. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. Now think about that statement. Whatever you're going through is part of the long history of the human condition. You can't ever say, oh, I'm the only one in history that's ever gone through this. No, no, no. But God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. Now, now let me throw this out too. I would say that that's another blessing of the good news. That this is a promise and a statement about God. That he is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. That is provided we want a way out. <laughs> That's always a big if. Okay, let's end with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight aware of this whole area of temptation and evil. Uh, help us to be more sensitive uh, to the resources that you give us so that we can withstand temptation. And we don't have to give in to all the forms of evil that the evil one uh, plans and schemes. We thank you for the perseverance of Jesus, his example, and that we can rely on him. Help us to be examples to others. And as we talked about, if we're relating to those um, who need uh, gentle guidance and correction, help us to do it with the right attitude and spirit so that people can see Christ living in us. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Thank you all for being here tonight.